Okay, everyone, welcome back to the next webinar series for uh, with the San Diego Chamber of Commerce. Many thanks to Monica, Grace Tayama, Fred, Katie, many others for letting us, you know, have a time that small business owners can get together and I can lead a little lecture about different aspects to make your business grow. This month, we're focusing on name your best customer. Sounds kind of like a cheesy game show, but the truth is it's really going to be about how you can identify, characterize, and really capitalize on finding in your mix who's your real best customer. And then if you can find attributes about them, you can clone them and get more. So that's the focus of today. Um, so many of you that don't know me, my name is Doug Younger. I am the founder and CEO of Three Steps Forward, a technology savvy marketing company that helps startups, inventors, small business owners, we uh, nonprofits succeed with digital marketing. Uh, if you didn't know anything about me, I'm getting personal now. You can see, guys, like, you know, I'm a father. I'm actually, uh, I should say, a husband, father in that order. Um, but I have my, uh, my pretty wife there and three sons. Um, I am also an entrepreneur, as you know, but I'm a lecturer. A lot of you don't know that. I actually teach the executive MBA um, lectures in collaboration with Cal State. I'm um, working on some things with Case Western. And we're looking to work with Sacramento State as well. So, um, you know, I do a lot of these lectures about small business and enhancing uh, businesses. Um, a lot of the bank of where my domain knowledge comes from, um, I've actually worked at a variety of companies internationally. Um, I've traveled to 40 countries and I'm over a million miles just with United. So, you know, that's another whole aspect of my life. If you ever want to talk about some of the places in the world I've been. But now I do a lot of management consulting and work with the SaaS industry, AI, VR, exoskeletons, powered exoskeletons, medical devices, medical imaging. Um, I uh, did my MBA myself at Case Western. And you can see um, Bowling Green State was where I did my undergrad. I'm an Ohio boy. Now, granted, I've died and gone to heaven. Now I live in California. I'm very happy with, with the de not dealing with snow, but that's a little bit about me. And I'm hoping you learn a lot from this lecture. About my company, though, we help people reinvent themselves. We're a full service marketing group. Um, there's about 30 plus of us now. We just celebrated our second year anniversary. We have over 34 startups, which is amazing. Um, we're quite busy and we're official partners of the San Diego Gulls and the Kings. As Stephen had mentioned, um, I get down to San Diego about once a month. Um, I go down to the Pachanga Arena with my Gulls friends, which I encourage all of you to do. And I give a military veteran award um, to um, really honor our, you know, the service, the dedication of our military service member, but not just in military, but in life. I really look for veteran owned businesses and really acknowledge that they're employers and they're doing great stuff even afterwards. So this is a really fun initiative. And I hope to see some of you there. If you want to go to a game, you know, let me know. Like, let's, let's go, let's go talk. Okay. Today, sticking to business here, we're going to be focusing on a couple things. First of all, you're going to learn today about the criterias to select your best customer, criterias for competitive advantages that you should think about when thinking of your customers, target setting, segmentation. And then I'm going to do some really interesting real world conceptual examples with the Tesla Cybertruck. Now, I don't know if any of you are thinking about electric vehicles. You should. But I'm going to use that as an example to go through target markets, persona setting, purchase decision-making criteria, customer buyer's journeys, the digital campaign, and the reasons why you should always cooperate in business, not worry about the other guy, okay? So great stuff. Um, you know, Again, you'll see some social posts from me on Two Steps Back, which is on my LinkedIn channel. It's a campaign where I talk about a lot of these business initiatives. And there's a post about uh, coming up 1984, George Orwell's My Favorite Book which leads into where I always kind of get you guys warmed up and juiced up. So first, here's my top five corporate survival book list. Last time it was fictional books. Today, um, 
I actually am a former GE guy. So Jack Welch winning, of course, is going to be my number one. I strongly recommend some of you to check out the intellectual devotional. It means 365 days a year, they give you a new tip and trick how to live your life in an interesting way. So every day you can say you learn something new. I think that's a good one for all of you as small business owners. There's also Sun Tzu's Art of War. This is where the enemy of my enemy is, is my friend or you know, when at peace, prepare for war. All these interesting analogies of applying for business come from Sun Tzu. You should definitely check that out. Who Stole My Cheese is actually a great book about navigating the maze as a business owner. And lastly, The Challenger Customer, which is very important for the topic at hand. It's about exacerbating the pain of a customer not going with services or working with you and how you can characterize and amplify um, and get them to make a decision. But I wanna hear from you. What's your favorite top five corporate survival book? Now, everybody, you need to get off the bench and in the game. Get over in that chat. I want you to share one of your favorite books. Doesn't matter what it is. Don't be shy. Just go ahead and type that in there. I'm gonna type, mine is Jack Welsh. Go ahead, don't be shy, I'm gonna do it. And there's gonna be a lot of chatting amongst all of you. Your collective experiences uh, really help everybody. Look, there we go, all right, we're rolling now. We got The Happier Attorney, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that's a good one, that's a good one. Um, the Weight of the Seal, that's great, Made to Stick, very good. Let's keep this up and then keep posting your books and then at the end, you know, everybody can benefit from that. Dare to Leap is good too. Dare to Leap, yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first interactive polling question to kick things off. When you think of your best customer, you got to think about the criteria of selection for your business of identifying why you think they're the best. Now, here's some interesting criteria: Brand loyalty, meaning they just like the what you, you do. They're going to come back to you every time. Price insensitivity, meaning they're just that loyal. They don't care that you change your price. This is a good situation to be in, but that's not the situation most of you will be in. They give live feedback. This is a good one because that means you can learn from them. They give online reviews like Yelp reviews, or they'll refer their friends, which is uh, e and then F is repeat purchasers. I'm not going to use the polling function. I think that's kind of threw some people for the loop in the past. Why don't you go in the chat? I want you to choose A, B, C, D, E, or F. Look at that. Repeat purchasers is from Monica right off the bat. Cow, she's fast. There's referrals. Oh, people want referrals. People want referrals. You got to get them, right? That's a good one. Oh, look at Susanna. Susanna cheated. Okay, so Susanna wants to get them all. She wants B and F. I get it. I get it. But if you had to pick one, Susanna, which one would it be? I got it. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a trend. That's how things work, right? So there's a lot of repeat purchasers and price insensitive. I will say this. Any of these criteria are good, but it's clear you need to pick your poison, which is the one you want when you look at your book of clients and say, this is the criteria that that we're looking for then and that we want to encourage. That's important in front of your digital marketing strategy. Also, I want you to know, these criterias have changed quite a bit due to the coronavirus pandemic. There's a great article from Harvard Business Review that's hyperlinked in this. Um, ensure that your best customer relationships outlast coronavirus. You can Google that. It's very important that you take a look at that book. Second interactive polling question. I'm really getting you guys warmed up. The competitive advantage of your business, whatever that is, can actually factor into the types of customers and the way they think about you. All of us have certain tendencies, and I'm going to go through some of this. When you think of competitive advantage, like in the core Peter Drucker business school logic, there were three criteria, and now there's four in the modern world, brand, technology, price, and community. And I'm going to talk about each one. Brand is a lot like analogous to Target or like Apple. Some people will purchase from you because maybe you have a family history or they've always done business with you. Um, there's certain nostalgia associated with you. And that's an example of brand. Technology 
technology means they always have some type of technological advancement or advantage. Price is like Walmart. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's low quality. It just means how you price is kind of like the number one thing. Community, which is totally different and new now, means a lot of times purchasing of a business is tied to the social networks associated with it. And this one's a big new category. So now I want you to jump in the game. Look at that. Michelle's already, you know, she already got it. There's, I want you to choose A, B, C, or D. What is your preference as a small business owner? Where do you, you want to play the game? So it looks like there's a couple social ones out there. There's brand. And don't be shy. You got to think about this. Because let me tell you why this matters. The way you compete as a business is already self-selecting. Certain people, for example, will say, I don't buy cheap stuff. I would never buy, I would never purchase at Walmart. Some people are like that. I'm not saying I'm that guy. I'm just saying some people think that way. So that means don't try to say that your best customer is around low cost prices if you really want to compete on brands. So you really need to think about for your business, how that works. Also on the community front, I know that's new for a lot of you that, wow, social media matters a lot. Actually, you can see a lot of people in this chat. It does matter a lot. But there's an article from Harvard Business Review about when community becomes your competitive advantage. There's another great article. Okay, now let's kind of start building on these like concepts. So first of all, let's say now you've decided, okay, I know the criteria for my best customer. I know even the advantages that I have and the things they're seeking for. But there's more to it. First of all, demographics. And I get it. I get it. You're going to say, Doug, see, I caught you. I caught you. If you're going to characterize customers in groups by age, sex, race, religion, you're going to say, Doug, that's stereotyping. I caught you. See? No, you did. Actually, this is very much a part of your marketing strategy. You've got to think in buckets. There's demographics, ethnographics, economics, and interests. Okay? You need to think for your best customer, first of all, Generationally speaking, are they Gen I? This is the new group. Gen X, Gen Y, baby boomers, millennials. Is there patterns? Is there more females that come than men? Even their religious identity can matter because they may go to church and refer from a pool of people that I do my business with this outlet. There can be life cycles, nationalities. You've got to consider these things. Now, on economics, these are hardcore points. I would strongly recommend you to check out even local information from your SBA about income trends, discretionary income is what you really want to know. Like if you really want to price in premium, you need to know is your business either close to, you know, working class, middle class, upper class clientele? What's the commutable range? Is there wealth discrepancies between them? I mean, I'm not getting into the social side of it, but here's a reality of, do they have the income to meet your pricing strategy? There's what's their educational background? What's Who's their employer? Employer is a great pool for referrals, whether they're military, whether where they went to school. And at the end of the day, multi-generational wealth is what we all want. But that's also a criteria of finding good pockets of great clients. Now, interest is another whole thing. I could probably do a whole class about that. But in social media, people uniquely now can identify their interests. They actually, people go in and put in, I like these films. I like these musics. I like these, you know, I, I express my political affiliation. People will say, I'm Christian. I'm agnostic. I'm Hindu. You can find out all these things once you say, this is my best customer then you need to characterize them, okay? Next concept, segmenting them. So now we're going to build and say, okay, so I already have thought about certain things, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. You really now to go, okay, ask yourself certain strategic questions. One, where do we target this best customer? Do they commute from certain areas, as I discussed? Who do we reach? by the certain demographics we talked about. What problems can you solve for them if they have certain interests? 
And then you get into these other fringe areas that we're going to explore. Behavior patterns. Like, do they have a certain pain they're looking for? Do they have a certain switching cost? Like, are they already getting your service from something else? And they're referencing your new service with what they had? Do they not want to lose something? Do you think about who is the most susceptible to your value prop? Now, you all should know the lecture next month in February will be about value prop. Now, what you don't know is, first of all, as business leaders and entrepreneurs, you need to create value in every aspect, every moment of your life. You will fulfill a better life by create. don't waste anybody's time, create value for everyone. But how you articulate that value needs to be in three criteria areas. There's emotive argumentation on value, rational argumentation on value, economic argumentation on value. Those are the three areas that people may purchase decisions. Some people will say, hey, I got to go to your outlet and touch and feel it. Like my, you know, my wife would say, no, I don't necessarily want to buy shoes online because I can't see them, touch them, feel them, and they don't feel right. That's an emotive driver. Rational people will say, well, I don't need, do I even need your thing? I don't even, I'm not even thinking about you right now. Economic is, I don't like your price. You need to be clear, drive value in everything you do in life, but in your business, you need to think about the value you deliver in those three criteria. Predictive, like, okay, now you need to think, I'm going to find this best customer, but what is the KPI measure? Or, you know, what is your, you know, critical success number? of where they are. Is it traffic? Is it social media followers? Is it views? And so forth. Now, there is a Z access to all this. There's another plane that's not here. Some customers, no matter what you do, they could be, you know, potential customers, I should say. For whatever reason, they don't adopt right away. And there is a reason for that. There's a book called Crossing the Chasm. And I'm going to just scroll this up so you can see this. This book by Joffrey Moore, I strongly recommend because it characterizes everybody on a timeline in a bell curve here. This X axis is people who want new things and people who want complete mature solutions. And what you can see is there are a small minority of people, they'll try anything. <laughs> they're like innovative. Usually you talk to them, it's something new, they're going to go, I want it. There's other people that take more convincing. And in your business, you need to think in your timeline, is your best customers from which pool? Do they, are, are you an innovative technology company that they just try it? And it's like, wow, this is easy. Is it, it takes a lot of convincing because then you're kind of in an early majority audience mindset or a late majority mindset. And they may even be a laggard. So this is the kind of stuff that I think you need to think about um, for segmenting your clientele. Okay, moving on. Now, how many of you, I want you to go to the chat and tell me, has anybody heard anything about this new electric truck from Tesla? Who, who, who knows about the cyber truck and who doesn't? Just say yes or no. There's a quick, quick yes or no in the chat. Have you heard about the Tesla cyber truck? Okay, look, there's, there's some yeses. There's a lot of yeses and there's some no's. Okay. Just humor me for a second. I'm a marketer, right? I'll break it down for you. Okay. The Cybertruck is a Tesla product that's not released. It's accepting pre-orders. Currently, you can pre-order it for $100. There's an average selling price on this thing is going to be somewhere between sixty dollars and $80,000. So it's in the F-150 kind of competition level. It has an exoskeleton, making it more durable. It's built with stainless steel, so there's no paint. It's kind of crazy. It's not even like fiberglass. It's like indestructible. There's a volt storage. You can get dual motor or tri-motor, but here's the most important criteria you need to know. It's 500 miles per charge. Really crazy. So I don't know if you thought about an electric vehicle, but I'm just saying, 
500 miles, I can almost drive to the golf stadium and hang out with Steven in San Diego from where I live. Okay, so interesting product. We're going to use this as an example to go through a, a few more examples of how to find your best customers because Tesla has definitely found their best customer. Okay, Inter first interactive polling question related to this. What is the most attractive target customer segment for Tesla's Cybertruck? And I really want to know your opinions on this. Is the Cybertruck for construction workers, freight truck drivers, a suburban mom or dad? Like, can you guys see Doug with a mohawk and a red glass louvers driving this thing? Because it's all cyber sci-fi weird. Is it for existing Tesla owners? Is it for rural truck owners? or metropolitan truck owners. Cast your vote, A, B, C, D, E, or F, go for it. Oh, look, there's a lot of Ds. Wow, I wouldn't have thought that. Okay, there's some Es, rural truck owners, F, metropolitan truck owners. There's a C in there. Who is it, who did that? Oh, Michelle's, uh, she's, you know, quick on the trigger and a Tesla fan and a Cybertruck fan. Let's see, we got some Ds. Okay, so look, this is this is what the, the group's opinion is. Probably it's a little bit of a couple things. There's existing car owners that are Tesla users. There's rural that are current truck owners and other things. Okay, so this is this is a very good thing that that I think it's important that you understand as we go through is understanding. Okay, for your best customer, which segment are they? You should know like pretty easily like what you're doing here. Okay. Now let's let me break it down because I think I'm gonna blow some people's minds on this. When you think about target markets, I already told you about whether they're you know mass or early adopters or so forth. There's another way to characterize, which is they're either in a niche market, broad market, or mass market. And let me be clear: niche means it's like a specific segment that they have specific needs, and it's not so broad. Okay. Broad means it's kind of like they, it's a bigger market, but for whatever reason, they're so particular that it's not everybody. Mass market is everybody, okay? I can say in certain examples, I'm gonna break Tesla down. Their Model 3 and Model Y are mass market products. And the reasons why, if you look over in this chart on the right, the Model 3 has over 196,000 units sold last year, or let's say all time leading up to some point last year. The Model Y has 300,000 uh, vehicle units sold. So what you can see is those are high volume mass products. They appeal to a lot of different people. Now the broad market is a little bit interesting, or this, it's still large, but what you can see is the Model S and the Model X are more around 85,000 to 100,000 units. So big, Tesla makes money on them, um, but at the same time, they have very particular needs. Now notice Cybertruck. I think some of you would say Cybertruck, based on your scoring, is kind of a niche, right? Like if you're a rural truck owner or a truck owner, you'd say, well, that's only particular people. And also Tesla car owners are only particular people. Well, guess what? That freaking thing has 300,000 pre-orders. It has as many pre-orders as the Model Y. So even though that product is kind of like a niche market, it has niche characteristics. For some reason, it's appealing, the greatest appeal of any of their product portfolio. Whoa, some of you will say, Psh, mind's blown. There's reasons for this that we're about to jump into, okay? And I thought you guys would kind of get a kick out of like, <laughs> if you notice over here, like the Model S, 3, X, Y, it kind of stands for sexy. So the Tesla products are like, <laughs> actually spell out the word sexy. Let me tell you what that means. It's a, it's a funny joke that all of you should know that when you get rich and successful and you make that much money, you can name your products whatever you want. As long as they deliver value, it's going to mean something to people because, you know, th their products are sexy, pun intended. Next, we're talking about customer personas. And the root cause why the Cybertruck is so successful in pre-orders is related to this concept of personas. 
So when you're thinking about your best customer, you want to build a composite profile of who they are. You kind of want to have an idea. Some people even name them Bob, Tom, you know, Steven, Zach. Susanna, they actually will name their best customers and describe. Them. So this is what I did. I already knew you guys were going to vote a certain way. I bet that some of you would pick construction worker. Not many did though. Some, and actually none of you picked that. So that's an interesting thing. Truck drivers and professional executives. Now I'm going to break down each of them and, and it, there's a reason why none of you picked construction worker. Okay, one, first of all, you should know biggest market actually 11 million construction workers in the United States. This all comes from the Department of Health, Labor, and Welfare from the United States. 90% are men, 44% are white. They make about $36,000 as a median average per year. Their concerns or their problems are accidents on the job. Off-road terrain is a common thing for them. They have to commute to work. They use trucks on the job. Their employer is actually the buyer of their truck or they buy trucks for recreational use, okay? So largest market, right? Wrong, <laughs> because already what I think a lot of you detected, if it costs $80,000, I don't know that a construction worker is gonna buy something like that themselves. So subconsciously, a lot of you already made that judgment. Now let's look at truck drivers. Two million truck drivers. Actually, the number is, see us, Suzanne, the, the numbers um, for truck drivers are lower. It's about 2 million truck drivers, but 90% of them are men. There's a higher percent of them are minority though. So the demographics are a little different. Car accidents can be catastrophic for a truck driver. That's their concern. So insurance premiums are a problem. Highway travel is common and theft and crime risk. So you would think the Tesla Cybertruck is good for them. They want something indestructible. They can just drive through any problems. Well, another comment is their employer usually buys their trucks, but some of them do have their own trucks, by the way. And cost efficiency is big for them because they got to drive long distance. The technical limitations of an EV may not be good for them. Hmm, not many picked this one, but you can already see truck drivers, uh, I don't know if the, the cyber truck is for them. Last one, professional executives. Now it's getting interesting. 2.7 million professional executives in the United States. 67% of them are men, but hey, I'm rooting for you, ladies. I love women in business. So you got to get out there and do your thing. Like we need to improve those numbers. Similar demographics as truck drivers in professional landscapes with 63% white, 37% minorities. Now this is where it gets real interesting. Office workers on average make $37,000. Me corporate managers make a hundred to one hundred seventy-five thousand. I get it. I get it. Some of you may say, "Hey, Doug, I'm not making a hundred to one hundred seventy-five thousand. What are you talking about?" Well, you know, there is wage discrepancy is a real thing, but on average, this is what office managers can make. Senior executives make two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Well, guess what? If you look at their criteria: politics at work, multifamily activities, excessive travel. They commute to work, but now with they're working at home, but a lot of them, what you can see is they can afford to buy expensive toys. They definitely purchase social status symbols. They definitely, in a lot of cases, care about environmental conservation as a belief. And a lot of them have diverse vacation activities like camping in the, in, 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 you know, Tahoe or Mexico, wherever. So you're already starting to see that what Tesla did, their best customer for the Cybertruck was not what you'd assume a standard truck owner is. They found a new market, which is people like you or me. It, you know, full disclosure, yes, I did pre-order the Tesla Cybertruck. <laughs> Don't I fall in this criteria? I'm a professional executive, right? Okay, next question in interactive polling is a concept of purchase decision making. And let me tell you, in what's called the buyer's journey, when somebody learns about your business, bottom line, your conversion rate, your job is to make them get to the purchase decision. 
And understanding the criteria of your purchase decision is really important. Conceptually, in the example for the cyber truck, here are some examples of decision criteria. Now, a lot of you don't know, okay, that there was an announcement event for the cyber truck. You can go look on YouTube on this. Elon wanted to prove, hey, this thing's indestructible. So he took a mallet and they started whacking the thing and they whacked it in the glass and the glass broke. Now, hear me out here. Was that really a bad thing or a good thing? Now, some will say that's a bad thing, but I can tell you this, because so many of you, I see you nodding your heads, so many people heard about this. First of all, the fact that it can even take a mallet to the glass and crack is amazing. Because I can tell you, I can take a mallet to a Ford F-150. That glass is breaking. Okay, so that's one. Secondly, which Zach just picked up, that was huge publicity. So that's one thing. Maybe it just appealed to everybody. They're kind of like, it got my attention. So I want to pre-order. Secondly, form fit function. Doesn't it look like a Halo Warthog? I mean, I don't know if there's any Halo fans out there or, you know, <laughs> Aliens fans that are out there, but this thing looks crazy, right? It looks like it's straight out of a Hollywood movie. Maybe that's one of the decision-making criteria. Technical specifications. Guess what? 500 miles on a charge might cost you 15 bucks. Pretty amazing, right? That's a rational argument. Some could pre-order. It was $500. Now it's down to $100. Maybe it's test driving. Maybe it's the price per performance, which means about, I mean, I would estimate for best in class truck, it's about $1,400 a month, like in charging. Pretty amazing, right? Like, like overall, the value between charge and purchase is amazing. Okay. And I'll get into the math on that later. The lifestyles really, it lifestyle related. Okay. I can go camping in it. I can throw my kids in it, you know? I can look cool in it. I already told you, think of Doug in a mohawk and red louver glasses, like, right? It, it makes me young again, right? Like, come on. So when you think of that, I want you to cast your vote. Which criteria do you feel for a professional executive, if you agree with that, is how they would make a decision on the cyber truck? And all of you are professional executives, so just choose. Why would you, or pre-order one? Just go ahead. Just A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. So Zach right away knew it's the, it's, it's the 500 miles. He's a rational guy. And then Megan is all about lifestyle. Megan, we got to hang out, right? We got to go to the Gulls game in the cyber truck looking cool, right? It's, it's all about that. Then there's Aaron who's saying, oh, that's A, B there, okay? So then there's technical specs. He's, he's a rational guy. B, <laughs> Daniel's a halo player. Clearly. Okay. This is, this is important guys. I, I, I think this is really important. Uh, there's a question here. So it says, could this depend on how, this is a good question here. Hold on, hold on. So this is uh, Brittany here. Said, could this depend on how popular your company is beforehand? Take advantage of the virality of your own uh, sake. I agree with you. So there could be one that you're saying brand loyalty to Tesla, but actually that does not go with the criteria I just told you, because notice the Tesla Cybertruck has 300,000 pre-orders. That is not the same market as the Tesla Model Y. That is not the same market as the other ones. They tapped a new market. So I would say, yes, I agree with you conceptually, Brittany, but in this particular example, that is definitely not the case. They found a new market. Okay, another question. This one's got you guys riled up. I knew it would. So is the idea of being to something first or part of the, a new thing? Yes, that goes back to crossing the chasm though. Remember. Only about 20% of people will be early adopter or an innovator. So let, guess what? That's not mass market numbers. So wrong. That does not mean that it's just early adopters and innovators here, right? So then, okay. So then Brittany cast her vote. So this is, this is the takeaway, guys. For purchase making decisions, you need to write this down. The textbook thing would say there's five stages of making a purchase decision. There's problem recognition, meaning the customer is going to think, I got an issue I need to solve. Can you solve it? There's information search, which typically nowadays people go online on their mobile phones. They check out your social media uh, uh, feeds and they look at user reviews. So that already tells you 
you need to invest in social media. You can't ignore it because that's how pe- that's the primary method how people find out about you. Next is evaluation of alternatives. And this is important. Evaluation of alternatives means they're going to think about reference products. They have things that they may already have that solve a certain problem. You're just an alternate to that. And keep in mind, there's probably pros and cons that they're thinking about. They're thinking about, okay, if I leave this, what I'm doing right now to go to you, that means I don't get this, or I left this service or something behind. And they want to be kept whole, believe that. Customers are ravenous. You all are customers of things. You know you're ravenous, right? You want it all and you want it cheap, right? That's what you want. You want it cheap and you want it good and you want everything, right? Next one is then is the actual purchase decision. And and you guys should know the purchase decision happens in the weirdest times. Sometimes it's like two in the morning, they're sleeping and they're like, oh, I'm going to go buy that thing. It's not always an emotional thing. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes people will say, I'm going to go for a walk and decide if I'm going to sell this house or buy this car. Or I'm going to think about whether, you know, my wife went on Yelp and said, let's go to this restaurant for dinner. Well, I don't know if I want to eat that. Let me think about that one. That's the purchase decision. Then comes the final phase, which is post-purchase decision. And this is where a lot of you that like referrals, you need to think about that phase. It means after they buy the product, the buyer's journey is not over. Don't celebrate, throw your hands up in the air and say, I've done my job. They they bought it already because you want them to refer and you want them to buy again, which means you need to continue marketing to them just in a new way. If you want to check out a great article on these concepts, it's about how customers decide whether to buy from your website. There's a, there's a hyperlink there. That's important because buying in store versus buying online, totally different processes, okay? Now we're going to dive deeper into this rabbit hole on the customer buyer's journey. You heard me talk about that, right? This is similar to the purchase decision, but what you got to say is there's all these steps in the purchase decision, but there's steps prior to the purchase decision that you even got to consider. They break it down into pre-trigger, trigger, consideration, then purchase, then there's experience, and then they become brand loyal. Okay, let's break it down in Cybertruck terms. There's the Tesla brand, which was the pre-trigger. Like, you're, if you never heard of Tesla, you're definitely not buying a Cybertruck. So there's something to what some, somebody put in the chat room that, yeah, the brand loyalty or being aware of something was the step. That was the starting point. The trigger was probably the live launch event. I don't know if you guys know. They put it on YouTube. It got like hundreds of millions of views. And sure enough, it got us talking about it. And honestly, breaking the glass was probably a good move. There's the consideration part. So uh, this is where a lot of your customers get stuck. They go, you know, I got this other thing and I want to really consider doing this, but is it cool? Is it useful? Is it unique? They're actually thinking about what's called your USP, your unique selling points. And they're rationalizing it. Most of the buyer's journey stops here. Most people don't get past consideration. Then comes all the steps I mentioned about purchase decision. Then after they buy it, they're going to say, okay, did I have a good experience? And this is where it's important. This is where your value prop, you can't be fibbing now. Did your product do what they expected? Did you deliver on your economic value, your rational value, and your emotive value? If you did, they become brand loyal. If they didn't, they become brand disloyal. (laughs) This, you go, Doug, you know, wow, this is a lot to remember. The truth is you will live or die on the sword by understanding all the things, all the tools we talked about, about your best customer. But you need to think where your best customers were in the buyer's journey. And the question you need to ask that best customer is how did they come out of consideration? What made them buy? Once you start to figure that out, you'll find more best customers. And you'll start to find that there's a lot of them out there. And you can identify them and go after them. 
This is probably what's the single strongest point that I can make in this session today is that understanding your buyer's journey and really identifying what it takes to get them out of consideration. Next, you can say, all right, you know, Doug, I got, I got it down, man. I got the target audience. I know the market. I know, you know, I know everything about them. I got the personas, but then now I got to go out and storm the market, right? Like I know my best customer. I did all the research, but now I got to go out after them. Well, this is a criteria that, you know, in my trade, in my business, this is how we do it. We say, okay, we know our buyer's journey steps and we know that we have some digital marketing strategy we need to think of. We have some content we need to create. We have actions that need to happen. And then we need to choose certain platforms and we got to select a budget and a KPI or key performance indicator. So let's just talk what Tesla did, okay? First of all, the Tesla brand is sexy is the pre-trigger, for sure. They already, you know, this is not market creation. They already been playing. Then you have, okay, they have a certain content, which they're saying it's a luxury truck. That's a new category, people, new category. I mean, you've got premium trucks like the F-150 Raptor, but this is kind of a different thing. They, they've kind of pioneered a new thing. Then they said, okay, you know, we're going after it. It's clear and we're going to go high budget. And, you know, we're going after pre-testing and focus groups and we're going to leak details and we're going to do things. Then later they said, okay, now we're going to set up the trigger, which is we're going to host a live stream event online. And they had Elon Musk show up and they tried to break the glass. Okay. This was a trigger event. And they brought a lot of, you don't know this, they'd spent special invites to reporters and enthusiasts that would go and write about it, okay? That was, and, and guess what? The budget's, I mean, you say the budget's low. Guess what? It's not that expensive to do that. You put everybody in the hall, you get them drunk, and then you just say, hey, have fun, check out my products, like a demo, right? Now, next comes consideration. Remember, I told you this is the critical phase. Tesla released the technical specifications and photography online. And the cost of that's low. It went on their website and the number of clicks were high. All they had to do is basically, and the cost is low because all they had to do is get a photo shoot of the product in a variety of environments. There's no test data. There's no trial driving. Like there's no test videos really. They just did that, okay? Then came pre-orders for, for them is the purchase decision. They did it online, okay? They also, you know, use the pre-orders to do demand planning for supply chain. It's pretty smart, right? Like this, you could assume this is a niche product, but I just told you there's 300,000 pre-orders so that they better build capacity for 300,000 people, which is the largest volume product that they even have created yet, okay? You should probably buy Tesla stock. I mean, I can't give you that advice, but I'm just saying, they're still got some growth ahead of them. Then they start focusing on experience and brand loyalty. And one of the rewards um, that they could say is they're given, actually, they'll give like some referral code and then you get a promotion for a thousand miles of free, free charging, okay? So they got this all figured out. They nailed it. You all should be thinking to yourself, now that I know my best customer and I know my product, I need to build a digital campaign in a similar way, step by step walking them through this process and you're going to get better conversion rates. You're going to not just get a bigger funnel. You're getting the right people in your funnel for your product. I hope this is informative for you guys. Next comes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> game theory. Now this is, uh, you know, you guys may not hear game theory. I'm going to bring up a very important point for all of you. I got a lot of people that when they start out as small business owners, they say, yeah, but I need to come up with a great idea. Wrong. I've seen bad ideas with great marketing make a lot of money. So that's already not true. But then they say, yeah, but somebody else might take my idea. Okay. I'm going to talk about that part. Okay. First of all, you got to beat that competitive perspective out of you. Okay. Yes, you need to be competitive. Be the best you can be. But you want to cooperate in all that you do. And I'm going to use game theory as an example. So first of all, game theory. 
Game theory is the study of a mathematical model of strategic inter or decision making between rational decision makers. It means people like one, two, three, four, five people, whoever, that are rational minded will behave in certain ways in a competitive situation. Okay. You just have to take that as an assumption. There's a couple examples of game theory in applied. The prisoner's dilemma. I don't know if any of you heard of that. I'll do a quick example on that. Nuclear deterrent theory or nuclear warfare is an example of game theory. It's like, you know, back in the Cold War, the US could press the button, the Russians could press the button, but guess what? The result of both of them pressing the button is not as good as both of them not pressing the button. So what did they do? They cooperated. Nobody pressed the button. <laughs> That's game theory at its best. Labor relations <laughs> at work for all your employees or whatever, game theory is definitely in play. Okay. So here's an example. Here's an example. There's cooperative and non-cooperative as a result. So I'm going to give you some examples. Case A. You take two prisoners, they get in trouble. They've been arrested, okay? Case A is prisoner one remains silent, says, I'm not gonna tell the police anything. Case two, or uh, prisoner two says, I'm gonna confess. So that means prisoner one gets 20 years and you know, prisoner two gets released. That's case A. Case B, two prisoners and they say, Prisoner one says, I'm not going to tell the cops anything. Prisoner two says, I'm not going to tell the cops anything. And then they both get one year in prison. Okay. So both of them get one year. Case C, prisoner one confesses. Prisoner two confesses. They both get five years. Okay. These are three examples of game theory and how two people can cooperate. You should think of it like this. You and your greatest competitor <laughs> are, are in a prisoner dilemma. So you could say, you know, I'm a restaurant owner. There's a restaurant across the street. We're fighting for business. <laughs> and then this is now the competitive scenarios you have to think about. Now, I want everybody to consider voting on an interesting scenario. One, which of these cases do you believe is the, it demonstrates the greatest cooperation possible? Meaning, of the two people, what is, is it case A that prisoner two confesses? Is it case B that they both remain silent? Is it case C that both confess? Which one do you think is the greatest cooperation for the greatest outcome? Why don't you cast your vote? A, B, or C? And E is, if you could put uh, E is, I don't know, but it should be D, but it's okay. Okay, somebody pick B. <laughs> Stephen Big B, because he goes, wait, look, I don't want to go to prison. <laughs> Nobody wants to go to prison. I agree. Then so, anybody else got a vote on this? People are thinking about this one. They're noodling on it. Oh, wow. There's a lot of Bs. There's a lot of Bs. You know, I'll tell you why people don't want it, because the truth is nobody wants to admit to confessing. <laughs> but the truth is you want to move in what's called maximizing utility. And let me tell you what that means. Just like nuclear deterrent theory, by both prisoners being silent, they get the least penalty maximum time of the cases. There actually is a correct answer. The answer is B. Because if you add up the total amount of prison time, 20 years versus two years versus five years, actually the scenario that has the, Best scenario of cooperation between the two is to have the least amount of prison time. This is a textbook example of game theory. And um, I can tell you this, if you're in business, do not be afraid for the fact that there is, you're the first mover and a fast follower comes along. Because the truth is later on, you can buy them out or they can buy you out. Either way, <laughs> that's a good thing. Also, it means as they're dealing the buyer's journey, they're educating other people about the services you have. And maybe you can take market share from that. So you definitely need to, in my opinion, cooperate, partner. Like you heard me say, I'm a partner of the San Diego Gulls. I'm a partner of the Sacramento Kings. I'm a partner and I'm working towards partnership with you know, Cal State or Case Western. These are moves of strong business businesses and strong business leaders, cooperate. Okay. In 
summary. This is what you learned today. One, how to characterize your best customer by demographics, ethnographics. How do you find the most attractive targets by customers using customer segmentation? How you definitely learned about about the differences of niche, broad, and mass markets. And remember, don't assume because your business is in a niche market that you're not gonna make a lot of money. I already smashed that with the Cybertruck exam. You need to create personas, get in the weeds of characterizing of the different types of customers you had, aspects about them. What's their discretionary income? Where do they go to work? What, what criteria could you take advantage for them? Then you break down the buyer's journey. You take down all the steps for purchase decision-making and everything it takes to drive them into that decision. I think you all agree the Cybertruck is an interesting case study example. And whenever possible, never forget game theory. Don't be afraid of competition. Be the best you can be. And if somebody wants to come and grow, you can say, hey, this is a blue ocean, baby. We can grow all together. You have to think about that when you're a small business owner. Okay. Now, if with that, I'm going to move into questions. I also thank all of you for your participation. But if you have any, <laughs> one last polling question, d d d humor me this. How many of you are going to pre order the Cybertruck? Please say yes or no. I want to see a yes or no. Are you going to pre order the Cybertruck? Oh, <laughs> there's some no's. Meredith says no. Daniel says no. Steven says it is my guess. Okay, no worries, Brittany. You have to go. Oh, yep, yep. There's a, oh, <laughs> look at this. You can see, like, it's interesting here. Like, look, there's a lot of business people here, definitely professionals. Um, you know, Monica wants to see, look, Monica wants to see mine though. You know why? Because she wants to see me in that mohawk with those red louver glasses. That's what it is, right? Right, Monica? I already know. <laughs> well, okay. Great session. I know some of you have to go. If you want to stick around, fine. I will take questions over the next 10 minutes. Again, I thank all of you. Look, this is an advantage of being a member of the San Diego Chamber of Commerce. They're bringing great content, great speakers. I hope you're a fan of mine. Check me out on LinkedIn. You can look me up uh, www.3sets4.com. Um, you know, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do another webinar next month. It's gonna be about value proposition. You get to see would you? And th there's a great great block next time. It's gonna be about whether which value props better. It's called value prop wars, <laughs> where you go is the Popeyes chicken sandwich better than uh, Chick Fil A? <laughs> Is it Michael Jordan versus LeBron James? <laughs> you guys are going to fight each other in that one. And we're going to have fun there. So any other questions about uh, your best customer or any of the content today? Feel free to sound off in the chat or unmute. And we're all adults here. Yeah, Megan had fun. Great, hey, Megan. Thanks for coming. Monica had fun. Hey, hey, Doug. Hey, <clears throat> this is um, <clears throat> this was really helpful. Um, you know, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm on the other side of the table, so I, I work with business owners, not necessarily a, I'm not a business owner, but knowing more about what goes in their psyche and how they buy definitely helps me with sure. my approach on what's important to them. Um, you, you you mentioned you know one of the the, the top five things about your, your purchasing um, cycle, and one of it is it's fighting the problem right and, and yeah and, and trying to bridge that solution and that's like uh, look you should know this steve some yeah. people aren't even aware they have a problem like they're, they're, they're like they didn't even know they're like oh until i saw your product i didn't even know that that i had this problem or i was wasting time or i was doing this right right and it, it's a touchy subject because i you know i don't want to go in and meet with the client and just assume there's problems so i, I get more of a holistic approach on, on their business and how they can make it better and and what gaps we can bring. Um, but this presentation really allowed me to sit on the other side of the table um, and, yeah. and be that buyer or be that um, that that business the customer, owner. The, and, the, on, the, on the customer side. Of yes, yes. So great job. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I know, Stephen. Listen, 
I, and you're in HR services, um, just so you guys know, Stephen does, it's kind of like outsourced HR uh, services. So I look, I think the number one takeaway for you, for sure, especially when talking to business owners is, the, you know, you can't just assume, like the one criteria is, okay, are they recruiting, right? Easy. Then it's, are they overwhelmed? Or are they having challenges with that? Well, everybody's having challenges with that with the great resignation, right? Like, but the issue is in that business owner's mind, are they even aware that they have a problem? Right. They may not even know like, oh, like, you know, my internal HR is not able to, to hit the targets we need, or I'm not able to recruit what I need. They may not even, it's not even top of mind, but I can tell you that's the start of the buyer's journey, period. If they don't recognize there's a problem and that there's some pain that results of it, you're not going to be successful. You got to start with that. Then you got to push them down the pathway towards consideration. And, you know, you got to invest. I mean, look, I can tell you this, guys, you got to invest to grow. I mean, that is a universal constant. Look, the cardinal sin of the entrepreneur or small business owner is... I will do it myself. It's the cardinal sin. They'll do it every time. You cannot take that attitude. You've got to open up your mind and already start looking like, okay, you know, I got to try new things. But as if you're trying to identify your best customers, you got to recognize that they might be doing that cardinal sin. Oh, I'll just do it myself. So that's where you got to say, yeah, but there's a problem with that. And there's pain associated with that and that it takes more time. And once you start making that argument, they're going to start listening to you and they're going to start consideration. And then they're going to, you know, oh, you know, yeah. Or they may say, oh, you got a webinar. Or you got like a, can I come by your store? That's a trigger event. They're, they're already kind of like, ah, now I got, I'm thinking about stuff now, you know? So that's, that's a good, good point, Steve. Steven, thanks for sharing. Any other comments, questions? I just want to say thank you for your time. This was this was awesome. It was good meeting you too. Oh, it's a pleasure, Zach. Zach, are you going to come back? You can't go Absolutely. away. Absolutely, I'll be here. Back. I'll be here. Hopefully, I see you at the goals game. I love hockey. I've been playing it my whole life. So hopefully, uh, hopefully, I see you there. Oh, you're a brave guy. Did you did you see the picture? Where I was out on the ice. I did. I did. Listen, yeah, that listen. was awesome. Well, Zach, let me tell you. Now I don't know how to skate, <laughs> but I know how to fall and get up. That's what I. There you I, go. I that's, that's what half I told. The battle right there. That's half the battle. <laughs> So, so no, I actually went out skating with the Gulls uh, trainer and uh, oh, no she, she gave me some tips of staying upright, which more or less is like, you know, they're skating with two skates or you can put the hockey stick down and now you got three contact. Points there you go. The tripod is a lot easier. See, look, at that. look, you guys are like, whoa, Doug's coming out, right? Like, <laughs> no, yeah, Zach, we'll, we'll uh, send me a note and yeah, I'll, uh, next time I'm down there, I'll see you. Absolutely. Great meeting you. Pleasure. Yeah, AB, thanks for uh, uh, definitely coming. I, I see you there. Yep, yep. I'll see you star side, my friend. I'll see you star side. Monica, my friend, you had fun. It was a good session. Month. Thank you, Monica. You what happened? You don't. You're not buying the Cybertruck, right? No, I think I need a pay increase. <laughs> <laughs> so you're yeah. That will get so that. Thinking. Yeah, you're not in the manager or executive manager uh, part yet, but you'll get there. You'll get there. Not yet. That's right. That's right. There, that's what I want. Upcoming to business owner, you know? Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, you know, big things start small. You, you got to yeah. keep that hope. You never, don't have, ever let them take that out of you. You got you to gotta keep the optimist. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. See ya. Any other, any other comments? I got like one minute here. Yeah, see you, Steven. Katie, Katie, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming, Andy. Aaron, hey, it's good to see you again. This this probably helps you in your 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 financial services, right? Doug, you're a legend. It's absolutely. <laughs> um, I got as much notes down as I could, as well as uh, the buyer's journey was extremely helpful. And then I just really tried to harp on the number three, the consideration where your journey stops there. And then yep. 
uh, con continuing from that, asking yourself, how did I get the customer out of consideration? Um, I'm super yep. hyped, man, and, and I look forward to talking with you soon and just, you know what I mean, digging into some of these points. Because I like once once I'm like, dude, this is totally where if I do lose customers, this that's where I lose them. Yeah, in consideration, right? Like they did. Some of them may not even get to purchase decision. They're just kind of like, yeah, I'm thinking about it. You know, but they didn't, you know, they didn't get all the way to, okay, yes or no. Cause I can tell you if they say no, that information is just as significant as if they say yes, that's important. I, maybe I didn't bring that up earlier with everybody, but when they, when you get the purchase decision, obviously you want a yes, but if you get a no, that's just as important for you to know, because then you can come up well, what was the reason they did say no? What is the reason? Like, was it price? Was it, they potentially, they didn't, it, the pain wasn't great enough for them. Or was it they're, they're not an early adopter? There could be a variety of reasons. I think the, the per, when they, if they get the purchase decision, they say, no, you still want to do the follow-up. You still want to ask the question like, you know, hey, what, you know, what, 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 why didn't you move forward? And then that's something that you can take to bat in the next customers that are in consideration and before they get to purchase decision most excellent yeah absolutely so not even not even in the in the sense of trying to close the sale but just asking them hey is there you know can you give me any feedback or any data you know yep. as, as to why you okay yep. yeah i mean it's an opportunity you know it, it, it first of all it builds trust because because keep in mind even when they they say no and you consider that a closed loss Later on, they it can they it can, be, it can convert to uh, close one. They could go off, and then something happens, and then they're like, "Okay, now I got to come back," and I go from close loss back to close one. You just don't want to put effort into close loss. But my comment is, you want to learn from close loss. That's the difference. You don't want to put effort, as in time, labor, and money, in continuing cultivating somebody's close loss. But what you want to do is, you want to learn from a close loss. Because then you can make sure you get a higher win rate at the purchase decision by addressing some of the issues why a lot of people are going no. Most it's like detective excellent. work. It's very much Batman, Dark Knight detective work. Like you, you gotta, you gotta really get into why did this person say no, and why is this other one stuck in consideration? In a lot of cases, you'll see, you'll see a trend, you'll see a pattern. Most excellent. Speaking of the dark night, if if you if you're still talking to Ross, tell him I uh, I send my absolute best. Uh, I miss you guys. Okay, we'll do. We'll do. He watches. He watches these webinars, so he'll get a kick out of seeing you. So yeah. We'll oh, do. most excellent. Well, take care, Doug. Thank you. Yep. Okay, everybody. I appreciate you. If there's no other comments, questions, I'm going to shut it down. Thanks for coming.